that's a recent one, um, just a few weeks ago in the Upper Hunter. Yeah, dozens like that. This is what I've been asked to speak about. The health hazards of hand feeding. Obviously, I'm obliged to, to talk about the biosecurity risks of, of hand feeding and the farm biosecurity plans that you've all got in place now. Uh, other disease issues during drought and animal welfare we're going to finish up on. Some of these I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail. The rest of them we'll just touch on now. So as far as health hazards of hand feeding, I dare say, can anyone read that from the back? I'm struggling from here. How are you going? Can you? Okay, so what I've listed there, poisonous plants or botulinum toxin in hay and silage. I'm bound to mention it. It's not that common. Most people who make hay aren't complete knuckleheads. But occasionally, uh, when people, things get desperate, people buy all sorts of rubbish. Just they're desperate to get it and they bring it from outside the area. And you, if you're unlucky, you can find there are poisonous plants wrapped up in there or if there's a rabbit carcass or something in there. Large numbers, numbers of animals can hit the deck very quickly and you'll find out the hard way. Nobody here vaccinates against botulism unless you're a dairy farmer. And the reason they do it is because a number of them have run into that trouble where there's a carcass of a decomposing animal in, in the bale and it, it kills 40 head in one go. Fungal toxins in spoiled grain and pellets. If you are not accustomed to feeding out high energy feeds like grain and pellets, you need to be aware that you need to store them properly. If they get wet, some of the funguses that will grow on them produce toxin that are rapidly fatal and you can kill a lot of cattle in a hurry. So be cautious. If you buy stuff in and you think, gee, I don't know, that's, that's spoiled. This, if I'm buying it in bags and that feels like it's hard inside, be very cautious. I wouldn't feed it. I'd take it back. Admittedly, there are non-fatal um, toxins involved and quite a lot of the time I'll, I'll send suspicious samples away and it comes back and it's, it's not much to worry about. Uh, another one that people get concerned about is when you unwrap silage bales, you'll see great orange clusters of, of funguses uh, wrapped around it and people get very alarmed. Theoretically, you can get fatal funguses growing on hay and silage. I've never seen it. Uh, typically, the ones that cause the problems need a higher energy substrate to grow on. They need grain uh, or pellets or something like that. I find that cattle actually seem to like a lot of the funguses that grow around the side of those silage. That doesn't seem to put them off at all, and I've never run into any of them have any trouble. Urinary obstructions in steers, just be aware of that, that if you feed steers for, for months on, on grain, uh, because they've got a restricted urethra where it joins the penis, if there's not enough salt in the ration or it's otherwise unbalanced, the salt is there to get them to drink a lot, urinary obstructions can occur. They get bladder stones which go down in, inside the urethra and they block that. And unless you're prepared to pay for surgery and you're quick about it, they're finished. Um, and then this one, the spread of contagious disease when feeding in close contact you start drought feeding, you start feeding pellets, grain or around silage rings and you haven't done that previously, anything that's contagious, having cattle in close contact like that is likely to spread. So now the flies are starting, pink eye will get amongst them, fantastic environment to spread pink eye, you might have to take measures to avoid that. Respiratory diseases, if there are, uh, if there are um, respiratory viruses circulating, you have animals cheek by jowl and troughs and things like that. Anything that's amongst them is going to spread, and particularly if they're under a bit of stress or pressure, or perhaps you've got a pestivirus carrier amongst them, because uh, that'll immunocompromise everything temporarily. So grain poisoning, don't try and read it. We're just going to um, hit on the main points with the grain poisoning. Bill's mentioned it. Um, but just be wary. If, if you decide, yep, I've done my sums, I've done Bill's uh, sums there, and I've worked out it's much more cost effective to get energy into my cows by feeding them grain than it is hay or silage, and you rush at it, you won't have any more expense because you will kill them. Grain poisoning will occur if you, if you go at it too quickly. If their rumen is not adapted to tolerating uh, grain or pellets, the rapid fermentation you get with a high carbohydrate load that you get with the grains and the pellets produces an acid. If it if it's <coughs> absorbed sufficiently quickly, they'll just be found dead. Uh, those that are not initially fatally affected, it damages the wall of the rumen. 
and they usually die a few days later after you've spent a bit of money on a vet bill and some antibiotics and that sort of thing. Or you might try treating them. The gut actually stops with that sort of acid content. You can drench them with uh, rumen contents from, from healthy animals from the abattoir in order to get the gut going again. All sorts of attempts are made. You can put bicarb down their throat uh, to try and neutralise the acid effects, but better off just go very gradually when you're introducing grain for the first time. I know you can't read that, but that's the lesson. Uh, go very gradually. And I'm going to flash up some, um, some, some prime facts that the Ag, ag uh, Department or the DPI producers, which are very useful where this is concerned. One thing I should point out here is this. The ones that you will kill first will be your best animals. It's your greedy eaters. Um, you know, so it will be your best, best deer that's stone dead when you come out in the morning. I was going to point this out. If you're, if, if you're only a smallish operator or you haven't had a crack at it before, that's an example of a product that you can buy. And to make it easy for you to work out how much to feed them initially, there's a table on the back of, of the packet. Now, some people come unstuck. They'll, they'll do everything properly. And they'll say, right, oh, I've got 50, 50 animals there I need to feed. I'm going to start them at a kilo a day. And they calculate that out and they only put two bags out and then they're startled when they come out at lunchtime and one of the animals is stone dead. Uh, and that's because the cattle don't, uh, don't divide things evenly amongst themselves. <laughs> you greedy, and that's the disappointing thing. They, they, the greedy animal is going to be the one that suffers uh, and is your best animal. Um, now that's an example, let's just to show you, look for these. Now this is a table here that's in this particular one titled Grain Poisoning of Cattle and Sheep. This is a DPI prime fact and that is how you stay out of trouble. They're talking about the amount of hay you feed together with uh, grain when you're starting and then gradually increasing it you know, on a daily basis. So there are fantastic uh, bits of information out there that will lead you by the hand through grain feeding if you haven't done it before. Um, there you go. Uh, hand feeding cattle in drought, uh, grain, you, know, you name it. This is, this is the website that Bill mentioned. Bill says he's not computer savvy, but I've got to admit he's better than me because I couldn't find my way to those prime facts through the drought hub. But it's there, and I'm sure if you are clever, you can find a way. But even without doing that, and I was just, I'm going to flash up a, a, the sort of titles that you'll find. If you just Google New South Wales DPI prime fact, if you're not computer literate, there are handouts out there. But um, you can always ask, come into the office, ring us up, and we can print these sort of things out for you. But they're prescriptive. These are just some of the titles. Full hand feeding of beef cattle management. Now, that's the infrastructure and stuff you'll need, the planning you need to undertake before you embark on it. Full hand feeding of beef cattle quantities. They're as specific as that. Hand feeding cattle in drought, grain hay mixes. White cotton seed, a supplementary feed for beef cattle. You know, there's millions of them. Supplementary feeding of cattle, pasture assessment and livestock production. Making your own protein blocks for cattle. Bill was talking about leaks. Well, there's block advice as well. How useful are the blocks in the dry leaks? Everything you can think of. There's a whole lot of excellent material that the DPI, New South Wales DPI created before they uh, culled all their, their, re, their uh, extension staff. Now, the next disease... <laughs> oh, gave them the op <laughs> The next disease we're going to talk about uh, is commonly called pulpy kidney enterotoxemia. Now, people will tell me that uh, I don't have it on my place. Just, just back to the feeding. So even though it's a commercial feed, you just, you can, you just raise the point about chanting, even though it's the same feeding, you're buying little amounts of chanting. Yeah, and I, right, and it'll, it, it comes in here, and I don't know if I'd actually... Uh, put that in one of the others with nitrate, I think I mentioned it too, but that's a good point. Holeless bolus changing from one brand to another uh, or a slightly different mix one to another, rather than doing that as a stop-start thing, right? -o, I finished that silo or I finished that stack of bags, shanding is, is what Bernie's talking about there. So there isn't that sudden change in diet that might cause grain poisoning or might cause enterotoxemia. Um, mix 
you know, a little bit of this one, start introducing the new one. And the same applies to different sources of hay too. Just remind me to mention that when we get to nitrates. But this disease here is a, is a, is a very good reason for applying that. Enterotoxemia, it's a bacterial disease. Now that, that bacteria is a normal inhabitant of the gut of ruminants. It's just there. Uh, people have told me I don't have it on the place. Yes, you do. You do have it. If you have cattle or sheep or goats, you've got it there. That bacteria normally lives there in a low population. If you suddenly change to a richer diet, uh, that bacteria goes berserk and produces a toxin and kills the animal. You'll read descriptions about how you might find them, you know, uh, bellowing and mania and all that sort of stuff. The most common presentation that we see is they're flat out stone dead and they were a healthy animal that morning when you, when you saw them, and once again, it'll be your greediest eaters. Uh, they overdo it, and they're, and they're, they're often blown up like a balloon. There are two reasons for that. Um, one is that the, this bacteria that kills them is a clostridial bacteria. It's in the same family as all the rest of them in the five-in-one uh, vaccination group, so gas gangrene's in there and blackleg. Uh, as they uh, reproduce, they produce a lot of gas. So these carcasses go off quickly and they blow up like a balloon. The other reason they look puffy like that is because as part of the process, the rumen often stops uh, and these animals bloat terminally. So before they die or at the point of death, they bloat and that becomes confusing. So people will ring us up and they'll say, I didn't know that you could blow animals on ryegrass or I didn't know you could blow animals on grain. Well, you can actually, but that, we're talking now about different types of bloat. What is happening there is the animal is dying from enterotoxemia and you get bloat as a secondary and terminal effect. So the bacteria, you know, the lesson there is um, vaccinate and introduce the grain um, slowly. Now the vaccination is worth mentioning. So five in one vaccine covers enterotoxemia and, and most people are aware of that. What people do not seem to be aware of is that uh, the, the protection against the enterotoxemia only lasts for two or three months. So unlike the black leg component uh, or the tetanus component, where if you've given them their initial dose, two when they're youngsters and then an annual booster, you'll give them effective protection with, with that annual booster, not against enterotoxemia. So if you are thinking about changing feeds, let's say you've got cattle up on that, um, on, on that winter uh, native grass pasture up on a hill and you've got some oats or rye growing, late in winter you bring them down and you're going to put them on that, that's where they'll die. Uh, you get them in there, and once again your greediest eater goes mad, stone dead, same day, blown up like a balloon. That's because there's a change of diet to something richer. Or if you're about to finish some steers off for Mark and you think, I'll just put them on, on a feeder for a few weeks and, and tidy them up that way. If you know you're going to do that, two weeks before that change of feed, vaccinate them, revaccinate them. Now, five in one is cheap uh, and it's always worthwhile. I, I think that every time your cattle come through the yards, I mean, let's say put them through the yards four times a year, give them a five in one. If you use seven in one uh, routinely to also protect against lepto, there's no need to increase the frequency of, that, of the lepto component. It's, a, it's far more expensive. If you're topping them up just for the uh, purpose of protecting against enterotoxemia, five in one is more than adequate. Sorry, Bill. I might raise a question. If there's not concrete delay to use it on a shorter... No. No, as long as you're a bit careful about how you do it. I mean, your vaccination technique should be good and you should be in the habit of using clean vaccination guns. It shouldn't hang up in the yards for 12 months after you've used it and then next year, you know, you're wondering why you can't even depress the plunger. Uh, as a rule of habit, the, the, as soon as you've finished using it, uh, I flush them out. Even if you're not going to get back to the house for a while, flush them out the same, the same day in the yards, even out of a water bottle, and then clean them properly that evening and put them away. Maintain your vaccination guns so that you avoid things like vaccination site reactions and things like that. But apart from that, as far as hurting them, vaccinating them four times a year, for the sheep producers in the New England area, that would be a bare minimum. And the cattle producers have followed that path up there too because pulpy kidney is, is common. Oh, 
Righto, you probably can't see those carcasses, but this one is a surprise to people. Everyone thinks that hay and silage is safe. Uh, that's, this is a feedlot just outside Singleton earlier this year where he, he was feeding silage and hay and he brought some new cattle in. They were fed exactly the same ration that the, the existing animals were on, but he killed a dozen of them in, in, short, no, in short time. And that's because the hay was rich in nitrates. Now, if you uh, make hay or silage from par or just pasture itself that's grown from a country that's been uh, fertilised with nitrogenous fertilisers, uh, under certain conditions, the plants will draw a lot of nitrate up into them. And that can be okay for cattle that are adapted to it, but for unadapted cattle, it will kill them very, very quickly indeed. The nitrate that's ab absorbed from their gut has an effect on the blood so it will no longer carry oxygen. You find them gasping, staggering around and, and going down, they die very quickly. Um, the lesson with that one is, once again, gradual introduction of new feed. So if you've sourced silage and you've sourced hay uh, from various areas, you get a new truckload in, rather than finishing one batch and then going to the next, unless you've actually tested those, those um, batches for their nitrate levels, it, it could easily be the case that the, the batch that comes in next is much higher in nitrates, a gradual changeover. Don't suddenly finish that batch and then start on a new batch because it's a terrible shock when you kill a dozen of them in one go. Um, and people think, you know, they, they're aware they've got a problem. They've got some oats and ryegrass in winter that can be terribly high in nitrates. And by the way, the nitrate levels go up a lot in cloudy weather uh, and overnight. So if you're going to bring animals down and, and, and introduce them onto strip feeding uh, oats or um, ryegrass, that sort of thing, don't put them in overnight for their first session because that's often a nasty surprise for people. Uh, put them in during the day. The other thing is if you're making hay, uh, bear in mind when you're cutting, if it's a cloudy day, it's likely the nitrate levels in the plants will be higher. And the nitrate levels don't go down by making the hay. In fact, you've, you fix the nitrate levels in that hay. And in fact, the risk in hay might even be higher because cattle eat a lot more of the stalk material in hay than they would if it was pasture. So just be aware of it. Hay can be a shocker. Um, and, and of course, it's the best hay. It looks fantastic. And that people are terribly disappointed when this happens. Um, but as I say, be a bit careful, shandy it in again if you've got different batches coming through. If you're concerned about the past you've got, I carry a, a, um, a garlic crusher around with me. I've got some basic dipsticks that allow me to have a bit of a look and see if pasture seems to be red hot for nitrates. Those of you that grow that sort of pasture, those sticks are available to you too. It's only a bit of a ready reckoner. If it jumps to purple, the, color, the strip color very quickly, it just tells me, gee, that might be a worry and I send it away properly for analysis to get an idea of how risky it is. Other risks of hand feeding, well, that's a welfare case. You know, that girl, I was surprised when I opened her up, she couldn't get up, obviously. Um, and so we destroyed her. I was giving a lesson to a new ranger in post-mortem technique, and I said, that is surprising that she has a full rumen, because I wouldn't have thought she had had anything to eat for a while. Well, then I opened the rumen up, and it's full of silage wrapper. Uh, and I mean, I see a lot of bits and pieces in rumens, cattle being what they are, there's always a bit of baling twine, that sort of thing, but I've never seen a girl manage to eat an entire silage wrapper before. But, you know, if they're desperate, be careful. So, you know, it's, it's not good enough to have silage netting and, and wrappers lying around. They can bring cattle unstuck when they're starving hungry. Biosecurity risks, we've discussed that. You do have a general biosecurity duty these days. It's under the new Biosecurity Act. That means you can't knowingly or recklessly introduce or spread diseases, weeds or pests. You get a bit desperate during a drought and you source a hay or silage or feed generally from somewhere, some other area, might be interstate, you might bring some appalling new weeds into the district. So you have an obligation now under that act to keep an eye on that, to make sure nothing nasty and new springs up on your property uh, because you're putting everyone else at risk. So, you know, that's just good practice anyway. You don't want outrageous new thistles and things like that appearing on your property. Uh, residues, chemical residues, be aware. Yes.
Yeah, we'll come to that. I'll show you the... So the question was that there was an attempt to source some hay and where they tried to get it, the people wouldn't fill out, wouldn't supply a commodity vendor declaration, I think is what you're talking about. So that would worry me. What I would do though, if then a lot of people, a lot of hay and silage producers are just not familiar with it. So I, it's easy for me, of course, I'm familiar with it. I print them out. I was buying some silage around Largs and Hinton uh, some, a little while ago, and I'd just take a stack of them with me, and uh, I'd get them. When they have a look at them, the hay producers, and say, oh, well, that's not much. All, all they're signing is that they haven't cut the hay or the silage while it's within a grazing withholding period after spraying it with something. If they can't sign that, there's a problem, because you don't want chemical residues ending up in your cattle, because that becomes a big problem for you and maybe for the entire industry if there's a whole um, consignment condemned that's gone out of a, a, an export meat works. So you are obliged to be careful about that. I know it's a bit fussy these days, but you actually signed up for that. As long as that LPA logo has been on the, NV, on the National Vendor Declaration form, you've been agreeing to be seeking that sort of certification every time you buy feed. When you're buying this sort of stuff, if you buy that sort of manufactured product from a, from a, a big source, you'll see actually you don't have to go any further because it, it states on here, no restricted animal materials, that sort of thing in the feed. So that makes it easier. But when you're buying bulk feeds at hay and silage, you have to go uh, to the extent of, of seeking that sort of uh, reassurance. Um, chemical residues, same thing, because people start looking for unusual things. You know, gee, I'll tell you what, I might try grape mark out, or the, I can get all these veggies from Coles, or I can do this or that. And things that have been treated with chemicals you're completely unaware of, the producer never intended they would end up in a cow's belly. You've got to be a bit cautious about that. Livestock, what do we got here? Oh, the commodity vendor declarations and avoiding restricted animal material was mentioned. That's, um, you've all got one of those in place, I'm guessing now, your farm biosecurity plan. That's just an example of the front page of the template. You're agreeing to all this by, if you go through that, that is a commodity vendor declaration. I've still got a stack of them in the car if anyone wants to uh, uh, have a look through them. You should be asking for them if you are buying this sort of material and putting it into food producing animals. There's, there's no easy way around it. It's just that now you've got that general biosecurity duty. You might be prosecuted severely. Uh, and, and under the terms of the National Vendor Declaration, if you're signing a stat deck, which is what that is, that there's no chance there's anything nasty in the animals, you are obliged to seek that certification. We're going to have to rush because I've got 30 seconds to get through the welfare stuff, apparently. Other diseases, well, plant poisonings during drought. Well, hungry animals eat some bizarre things. You know, be aware of it. Any cestrum around the place becomes a considerable risk. Uh, worms and liver fluke. Um, not all of this region has, has, uh, has liver fluke, but let's say up around Gloucester and um, that sort of area there, we find the fluke burdens uh, go up during droughts because the animals tend to graze in those last green gullies that have you know, got a bit of green pick in them, which is where the snail that carries the fluke uh, obviously remains active. So liver fluke um, incidence goes up and worms, cattle are grazing lower. Drought and uh, overstocking cases are where one of the few situations where I'll see, or the only situation usually where I'll see adult cattle that are suffering from worm burdens. Adult cattle, by the time they're over two, most cattle have a strong resistance to worms and it's just no longer an issue for them until you put enough pressure on them and until they're grazing terribly low. Blue-green algae, well, farm dams getting very low with, with lack of runoff and, and plenty of manure sort of uh, running into them. That's what happens, and those algal blooms, some of them are shockingly poisonous. Black leg, I just mentioned it because we're seeing a lot of it lately. Um, and whether it's because uh, the, the animals are grazing lower and picking spores up, the theory about black leg, they graze and, and ingest the spores that way. And whether there's more green pick over where, an area where a carcass decomposed in the past, and it's a bit sweeter, I don't know. But we have been seeing a lot of black leg. Okay, the welfare stuff. This is important. Um, now, these things we need to get clear. We are not a welfare agency. So Bill said, Jim will come out and drag into line. No, I won't. I'm not an RSPCA officer. But we can't avoid it, unfortunately. The, the RSPCA, they don't claim to be experts on animal nutrition or necessarily assessing livestock for their fitness for, for transport and that sort of thing. So it ends up in our lap. None of us like this stuff. This is thoroughly unpleasant work. 
Uh, the LLS policy is to refer all welfare reports to the RSPCA. They're a welfare organisation. Then we come in to help to provide the veterinary and nutrition advice. That's our role. Sometimes because they're our clients as well, they're ratepayers, we might go a bit further than that and try and help them. Um, we have an educational role. Uh, we also monitor welfare and sale yards for everyone's benefit, for the benefit of the reputation of industry. And uh, obviously during floods and fires, the fires earlier this year, we, that's us that's out there having to assess and destroy livestock that needs to be destroyed. Um, the RSPCA officers, and there'll be a lot of people in this room that will say, oh, bloody RSPCA, I oh, wouldn't be talking to them. There's some nice blokes that work for the RSPCA. The guys in this area that I've run into, none of them are head kickers. Uh, and they're well aware, and, and it, it's been mentioned, and we've got um, some representatives of the, the, the Rural Counselling Service here that can confirm that most of the livestock owners that I run into uh, that are affected, you know, have animal welfare problems, there are other problems. They are often elderly men that are in poor health and then secondarily, uh, mental health problems creep in. Depression is, a, is an easy thing to drift into when conditions get bad and then it becomes, they become accustomed to having bogged and starving cattle around them. It's, it's not normal and far from thinking that it's some bloody do-good or a greenie that's dobbed them in, it's always other farmers. Farmers have got to a point where they, I can't see that happen anymore and, and they report them. That's the way it works. Don't be afraid to contact the RSPCA because most of these people need help. Uh, it, it's not, the cattle are just a reflection of everything else that's going wrong on the place. Kirsten's given me the wrap up, but she'll have to come and drag me off. Um, that, is, that, is, that is the guideline that we are bound to apply. You know, it's available for everyone on the website. Welfare scoring nutritionally deprived beef cattle. Bill might even be an author, I don't know. Now, fat score one, just to give you a, st a starting point, I know. We've all got breeders that are looking like that at the moment. She's probably making a, a good start with that calf. These animals are not considered yet to be in trouble. It's when they get poorer than this. So the, then under fat score one, you get into the welfare scores, which are called high risk one, high risk two and downers. High risk one, you know, these girls, be cautious. We don't want them coming to the sale yard if there's a possibility they might collapse. Um, high risk two, things have got to a point where this guideline says do not transport. Once they're dragging their feet, knuckling over and wobbly, they're a risk. Nobody wants them in the sale yards or at the abattoirs and things like that. And then finally, well, that's just the definitions they'll give you there. These girls, she's finished. If they're at a point where I can, you know, we're trying to lift them up, I don't have any success. I mean, I, I give them bags of four in one to give them a chance and we put feed in front of them and water or whatever and I shoot them a day later. You know, it, it, once they're that poor, they're finished and they're often the lactating cows, they've got calves on them. Um, the catch-22, I point this out, we can't break the welfare rules ourselves. So we end up on these places and there's always uh, a variety of cattle. Some of them, the, the non-pregnant heifers, whatever, look fine. And then there are these poor, poor animals that, you know, are collapsed or can't get up. There's a whole variety. But we can only sell the stuff that is strong enough to go on a truck. So what is left is, is the weakest animals for the fellow to hand feed. And then we'll get these calls from the person who'd, who'd reported it saying, you bloody idiots, you destocked the wrong ones. <laughs> we can't put the poorest ones on the truck, you know. So, it's, you know, none, no one likes it. So these drag on then. And it's a big call to start shooting cattle out of hand if they're still upright. So then hand feeding comes into it. And I tell you, that's not a satisfactory course of action. Um, and bear in mind, once cattle get weak, now last week when I had to come down here, I was, here you go, I was dragging carcasses out of dams. Once these girls get too weak, uh, anything that's boggy becomes a disaster for them. She's drowned in about two inches of water, that poor thing there. Uh, and, you know, they don't get up again. We try, try, you know, to, we're making every effort. We want to work with these farmers, demonstrate we're not just out of hand shooting things. They don't get up. Uh, be aware of this, the fit to load guidelines, we're getting to the end Kirsten, don't put unfair pressure on your carrier or your stock agent by, by forcing to load stuff that they're doubtful will make the journey. They are obliged by law now not to load it, 
if it's, if it's not strong enough, okay? It's unfair of you to put pressure on carriers. If they say, gee, I'm a bit doubtful about that, it doesn't go on the truck. That's the way the rules work now. We do not want welfare problems in sale yards or abattoirs. Uh, you can, should be, all be able to see the, the sense in that. This was just a couple of slides to reiterate what Bill had said there, you know, with drought, assess just the situation you're in, you know, your, your, um, your, your available feed uh, and the livestock numbers. And when you're comparing the cost of your various options, uh, also think about the strain on you. You know, the practicality, the labour and the time and the stress that's involved. If you begin down this, this maintenance feeding pathway, unless you know the end point, this, this, that is a short course to madness, uh, or at least depression. Feeding for production is a different thing. If you decide, right, I, I'll tell you what, I've done my sums, I know I can get this amount of grain at this price and I can feed these to fatten them and, and Primo's got a grain assisted grid that I can tap into, I'm going to turn them off, fine. You know what the end point's going to be, you know how much money you can do your sums. Maintenance feeding, when you don't know when the drought's going to end, you can't do sums on much. <coughs> just how quickly your bank account will deplete. Um, anyway, failing to make decisions. We promote selling, you know, get rid of them. That idea that these girls are gonna be worth a fortune if you, if you carry them through, add the cost of feeding, you know, or deduct that from the money you expect to get back later, because it is expensive and it's bloody time consuming and it is heartbreaking when you don't get the rain and you hear that up the road and they got 50 mils and you don't get it and that, that drives people into, into despair. Right, that's it. Sell, oh, that one there. Sell and weep, but sell anyway. And remember nothing else, remember that. that. That should be your adage. That's the safest way to go. And that book there, that is excellent. Bill might be a co-author. That is available through that Drought Hub website. That is a fantastic um, publication. Thank you for your patience.